Okay, great. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to Asia Society Hong Kong's program tonight, a very special program featuring Professor Joseph Nye of Harvard. And tonight's program is talking about soft power, cooperative rivalry, and matter of morality. Uh, and Professor Nye is going to talk about his new book um, about moral leadership uh, and moral power from, uh, at the, let me get, to get the title right, Do Morals Matter? Presidents and Foreign Policy from FDR to Trump. And it's a very timely topic since we're two weeks from the US uh, presidential election. Uh, Professor Nye is somebody who knows, uh, needs no introduction, a uh, professor emeritus and former dean of Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, um, received his uh, bachelor degree from uh, Princeton, a Rose Scholar, and attended uh, graduate uh, and also PhD from political science. Uh, tonight, uh, Al Reyes, uh, associate professor and director of knowledge dissemination at the Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong. And uh, Al previously served as senior policy advisor to Canadian foreign minister. And uh, Al also uh, educated at Harvard and also um, at University of Oxford. Uh, and we're really delighted Al is gonna be tonight's um, moderator. And I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Al Reyes. Thank you very much, Alice. Hello everyone from Hong Kong on this very clear and mild evening. It really is my pleasure and great honor to moderate this session with Professor Joseph Nye of Harvard University, an iconic figure in political science and one of the greatest scholars of diplomacy, as Alice mentioned, best known for the concept of soft power. Uh, we have limited time, so I'll just go right into it. I hope you don't mind, uh, Professor Nye. So in your book, you essentially challenge, your, your book, Do Morals Matter? Uh, you essentially challenge the conventional wisdom that the foreign policy cake, if you will, is as you have put it, baked with interests, but with a little moral icing sprinkled on top. But you argue that history proves that morals have mattered and some presidents have been better than others at it as assessed by their intentions, their means and consequences of their actions. So you outline a three-dimensional test and offer results. I'm wondering if you could briefly sort of contrast three recent presidents from the sort of tiers that you came out with, the top, the best ones, the middle tier and the bottom tier. And I've sort of picked uh, uh, three from that because uh, you put Nixon at the bottom tier and of course, most of us here who think of Nixon opening to China being a sort of foreign policy master. And then you put uh, President Obama in the middle tier and Bush 41, George H.W. Bush at the top tier. So I'm wondering if you could just sort of contrast briefly the assessments you made in terms of their moral performance of these three presidents. Well, <clears throat> nobody gets a perfect score. Foreign policy is a different, difficult area and everybody's going to get a balance sheet with pluses and minuses on it. Uh, certainly, if we look at Nixon, um, uh, his opening in China was uh, a, a major plus. But the major negative on the other side of the balance sheet was the Vietnam War. Uh, the interesting thing is that Nixon didn't expect to win the Vietnam War. And if he didn't expect to win the Vietnam War, the question is, uh, why did he keep fighting? And uh, he, in his terms, said he wanted to get a decent interval between the time that he pulled out and the time that uh, Hanoi took over the South. Uh, that led to the deaths of 22,000 Americans, as well as countless numbers of uh, Vietnamese. And I think that's the, the, that question of, is that a moral action uh, when you sacrifice so many lives for what is essentially a fig leaf? Uh, in other words, Nixon didn't expect he would win. Uh, he was basically looking for a cover for his getting out. As it turned out, in the end, the cover was worth about two years between when uh, the Americans pulled out of Saigon and when uh, the North Vietnamese took over. And I, don't, I think sacrificing that number of lives for, for uh, that purpose was, was immoral. So, Against the, the benefit of the uh, of the opening to China, I I'd say the the action in, in Vietnam uh, outweighed that. Uh, as for um, George H.W. Uh, Bush, uh, we sometimes call him Bush Forty One, 
41st president, as distinguished in from his son. Um, I, I gave high marks to Bush 41 because he prevailed over the end of the Cold War with uh, Germany still inside NATO, unified inside NATO, without a shot being fired. Now, he didn't do this all by himself. He needed to have somebody like Gorbachev to work with him. But it took extraordinarily adept diplomacy and a management of his own uh, emotions and political interests. So, for example, when the Berlin Wall went down in 1989, people were criticizing Bush in the U.S. for not making a bigger deal of it, for not uh, uh, celebrating it more. And Bush said, look, I'm not going to dance on the wall. I have to negotiate with Gorbachev. In other words, he thought beyond his own immediate political interests. So I've got to work out a very complex situation and I'm going to maintain control of my own emotions and political interests to do it. That strikes me as a particularly a moral approach. Uh, Professor Nye, if I might just ask, uh, sorry, I, I got a request to ask if you could just speak a bit louder. That's uh, sorry oh, okay. to interrupt. I, yeah. I, will, I will bring the computer a little bit closer and uh, try to speak. A, uh, uh, yes. Closer. Sorry to uh, interrupt. No, no problem. But uh, you, but if you take the third uh, president you mentioned, which was Obama, um, Obama, I thought, uh, had uh, great moral aspirations. He made some very good speeches about uh, 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 you know, denuclearization and human rights in the Middle East and so forth. I'm not sure he was always able to carry it out as as uh, <clears throat> as well as he as he had hoped. Uh, and there were some situations where, for example, in Libya, where he went in to uh, preserve the uh, citizens of Benghazi from attack by Gaddafi. Um, but uh, that changed from a, uh, a operation justified by the Security Council uh, and to one which led to regime change, but with no plan for follow-up. You know, as Libya today is, is pretty chaotic, and there should have been some plan with the Europeans and others to have peacekeeping troops uh, in the aftermath. Um, but uh, so I, I think in that sense, Obama uh, had good intentions. Uh, in many cases, he, he uh, took uh, difficult and important uh, uh, decisions, but uh, I don't think the implementation was always as good as it might have been. So three different presidents, uh, three different judgments. But I think the main thing about my book is that I offer scorecards in which I rate people, but I'm less interested in people agreeing in detail with my scores than uh, doing it for themselves. In other words, thinking in all three dimensions of motives, means, and consequences as they make their own judgments of what's a moral foreign policy. Yes, indeed. Um, you make a, uh, you, you emphasize the importance of two aspects, um, prudence and contextual intelligence. And I'm wondering if you could explain uh, those two aspects that uh, you consider to be sort of moral virtues, if you will. Well, contextual intelligence is the ability to understand the larger context of the decisions uh, that you're going to make. Um, and that's where, for example, uh, the first President Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush, comes out very well. He had had a, 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 an experience in, in foreign policy, uh, which included the service in China, being head of CIA, ambassador mm -hmm. of the United States a very uh, a good record in terms of understanding uh, the context of foreign policy. And that's what led him to make a decision like the one I cited, that when it came to uh, celebrating the Berlin Wall in domestic politics, to think through, wait a minute, um, in the context of negotiating the end of the Cold War uh, with Gorbachev, the last thing you want to do is embarrass your uh, negotiating partner in advance. So that's a that's an example of, of contextual intelligence. You can contrast this with his son, um, 
uh, George W. Bush, Bush 43, and who had very poor contextual intelligence. He had uh, been governor of Texas, had not had much international experience. Uh, and, uh, you know, so when he thought that he could bring democracy to Iraq and the Middle East by invading Iraq, uh, that, that led to immoral consequences because he hadn't developed the contextual intelligence. Prudence basically means thinking through the uh, unintended consequences of your actions. In other words, you, you might have good intentions, as Bush 43 had, uh, to bring democracy to the Middle East. But if you are not, if you don't have contextual intelligence, you don't know how hard it's going to be, you have to be aware that there are likely to be unintended consequences, which can turn out to be very immoral in their uh, effects. For example, Bush's invasion of Iraq actually strengthened Al Qaeda in Iraq, and that in turn um, uh, basically led to the growth of, uh, of the Islamic State, ISIS, which had terrible uh, immoral consequences. So in, it, it, that's an example where uh, lack of contextual intelligence and failure to uh, think prudently about possible uh, unintended consequences led to immoral outcomes. Uh, so those are why those two concepts uh, play such a large role in my book. Now, um, spoiler alert, I'm going to ask you about Trump, uh, President Trump. So um, your, you qualify your assessment uh, saying that, of course, this could be just a midterm grade. And of course, it's still possibly too early to make a, 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 a sensible assessment of, uh, of, the, of his presidency. Um, but what, what, what are your thoughts about Trump in terms of the um, moral assessment? Well, Trump has a, uh, a particular uh, narrow view of uh, his interest and self-interest and the national interest, which grows out of his background uh, in uh, uh, New York real estate and as a reality TV host. So uh, it's not that Trump says America first. Uh, after all, you'd expect Macron to say France first. But it's that when it comes to defining the national interest, it's very narrowly done. It's sort of, I win, you lose. And uh, if you contrast that, for example, to an earlier president like Harry Truman, uh, who developed the Marshall Plan, where the United States gave away some 2% of its gross domestic product to Europe, that was good for America, but it was good for Europe as well. So that ability to define the national interest broadly rather than narrowly, I think, uh, is, is uh, a difference between, let's say, a president like Truman uh, and who I put in the top tier and a president like Trump who tentatively at least winds up in the bottom tier. This doesn't mean that Trump hasn't had any uh, successes or uh, I, I, I give him credit for a relatively moderate and proportional use of force in the Middle East. Uh, I think also uh, for uh, standing up to China on some of the abuses of the international trading system and intellectual uh, property theft that China was engaging in, uh, or uh, we'll have to see whether his efforts to uh, bring about some sort of peace between uh, Israel and uh, Arab states in the Middle East is going to be successful or not. So these might wind up on the positive side of his, of his ledger. But on the negative side, um, his uh, failure to protect international institutions. I mentioned earlier the Paris Peace, I mean the Paris Climate Accords and the uh, World Health Organization, which are both essential for these issues such as uh, climate change and pandemics. Uh, his failure uh, to strengthen American alliances uh, I think these are areas where they'll be on the negative side of his ledger. So while we can't give him a final grade because the exam's not over, or the term's not over for him, if you want, um, right now he's not doing too well as a midterm assessment. Now, uh, let's talk a bit about soft power, because uh, you do talk about um, uh, Donald Trump and his inability to wield 
soft power smartly, if you will. Um, and in, you know, I, I'm wondering if you talk a little bit about that, it, particularly in the context of uh, you, you, your discussion a little earlier about power with the, the, the and you've mentioned the, the 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 usefulness of working with allies that it's not necessarily having um soft power or wielding sharp power as it were but but we should think about how you can use power with others yes i think uh, trump is not very interested in soft power um he's basically uh, uh much more interested in i win you lose uh type of approach and not attracting people to his approach. Um, he's uh, his first budget director, uh, Noel Vaney, uh, said he wanted only a hard power budget, not a soft power budget, which means you cut the uh, funds for uh, overseas development assistance and so forth. Uh, so Trump has a um, has taken a position that uh, uh, it's hard power that matters and that prevails. Um, and I think he's not been very interested in soft power. And if, um, for to give you an example, take the, uh, the COVID crisis, which Trump has handled very poorly, and has, and it, and has, that's probably going to cost him the election. Um, but imagine that back in March or so, or maybe even in the later spring, he said, I'm going to lead the G20 in setting up a special COVID fund uh, where we'll all donate a significant amount of money to help poor countries with inadequate public health systems to cope with this virus. Um, it would have been actually good for us because you can't expect to have a virus which flourishes in poor countries without eventually it overflowing back into rich countries. So it would have been self-interest, but it would also have been a humanitarian interest. And that would have produced enormous gains for American soft power. That was not the way Trump thought about it. Trump thought about how do I blame China, call it the Wuhan virus, I'm gonna pull out of the World Health Organization. I'm not gonna join the COVAX uh, vaccine facility, which the World Health Organization is, is uh, promoting. So that's the example between a president who thinks about soft power and a president who doesn't. Professor Nye, if I might just ask you to again speak a bit louder, the control room is telling me that uh, they would they, they would very much appreciate that. Okay. Um, yes. Um, now, uh, one aspect of your book that I find very intriguing is, is is you actually deal quite a bit about China, and indeed you talk about the rise of Asia and the. Um, importance of technology as sort of affecting the way uh, leaders sort of make decisions uh, going forward in this century. Um, let me quote something you say about um, that no other country, including China, is about to replace the United States in terms of overall power resources in the next few decades. Um, so you're still saying that, you know, the, the, the idea that China will overtake the United States in many aspects that, that we have to be a little bit more tempered about that view. And then you say that, quote, rather than acting like a revolutionary power in the international order, China might decide to be a free rider like the United States was in the 1930s. That China may act too weakly rather than too strongly and refuse to contribute to an international order that it did not create. I, I find that very intriguing because of course the, the sense that people have these days is that China just is chomping at the bit to, to act very strongly rather than could, that it could be too weak. Well, I, I hope that that's correct. I'd like to see a world in which uh, China as its economic power increases, uh, plays a, the role of a responsible stakeholder as, Bob Zelik uh, once put it. Um, and there's some areas where it does. In UN peacekeeping, China has played that sort of a role. Uh, it's, it has uh, uh, joined the Paris Peace Accord, uh, Paris Climate Accords, and, and uh, uh, stayed in it even when the US was withdrawn. On the other hand, sometimes there's a difference between China's uh, proclamations and its behavior, for example, on the issue of, uh, of climate, uh, China is still growing 
are building coal plants at a very rapid rate and supporting the development of coal plants through the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so there's a difference between its actions and its words. There's also areas uh, where China has, uh, uh, you know, it, it says that it wants to support the World Trade Organization, but with uh, uh, subsidies to state-owned enterprises with coercive intellectual uh, uh, tr uh, property transfer uh, measures and other things, it sort of tilted the playing field in a way which has led to disillusion by others with the WTO. So its actions and its words differ there. And when you come to something like uh, the law of the sea, where uh, the 2016 ruling of the Hague Law of the Sea Tribunal said that China could not put sand on rocks, reefs, and atolls in the South China Sea and claim these as islands with territorial seas, uh, China rejected that. So it's a mixed record. China's done some things uh, where it's living up to its uh, responsibilities uh, as a zealous, responsible stakeholder. There are other places, other examples where its behavior is distinctly different. I'd like to see China um, increase uh, its cooperative positions on these issues. Uh, and I think on some of these issues, as I mentioned earlier, in a sense of uh, cooperation with others and power with others, uh, it's going to require the U.S. and China to work together. The U.S. doesn't have a perfect record either, um, but it's going to, uh, you're not going to solve climate or pandemics uh, by trying to go it alone, either by China or the U.S. Thank you. Now, before I go to questions from the audience, I uh, you also say um, something about the U.S.-China relationship, and if I can quote you again, the U.S.-China relationship is a cooperative rivalry where a successful strategy of smart competition will require equal attention to both aspects of the description, but such a future will require good, and then here's the phrase, contextual intelligence, careful management on both sides and no major miscalculations. Cooperative rivalry, it's an interesting way to describe uh, this uh, relationship. Well, I, I, the reason I use this term um, uh, cooperative rivalry is to avoid the uh, fashionable terms in Washington now of a new Cold War in which uh, uh, people are saying, well, China is becoming more and more aggressive and uh, we have to uh, treat them as a, as a major threat. Uh, China does have some things that are threatening uh, uh, and there are things where we do have to stand up to them and should, uh, but we can't lose sight of the fact that at the same time, we're gonna have to cooperate with China to be able to accomplish our own goals in areas like climate pandemics. So the, the reason I'm promoting this idea of cooperative rivalry is to get away from the either or, it's, it's all black or all white uh, uh, attitudes toward uh, China. And uh, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, that political opinion in Washington doesn't uh, use this uh, phrase of a new Cold War to say the world is split into two. Um, in fact, uh, it's much more complex than that. And a moral foreign policy for the for this century is going to require us to have the contextual intelligence to realize that uh, China's not all good and not all bad, and that we're going to have to work with them. Thank you. Now, in fact, I have a question from uh, the audience uh, regarding this idea of cooperative rivalry. With an authoritarian regime as one of the global powers, do you think there is room for a cooperative rivalry? Is there any contradiction between the nature of power and practicing morality in the face of other powers? Well, I think we, <coughs> we, we, we meaning the US and yes. other Western countries can express our values. We don't have to necessarily uh, expect the uh, China to behave exactly the same way that we do. Um, for example, if we see something like uh, the treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, we should say that that's uh, outrageous. This wasn't just a, an American view. Uh, for example, the 
Economist of London uh, had a, a you know, in its last issue, a, a significant description of the of the uh, camps in uh, Xinjiang, which was really quite chilling. And um, we should not be afraid to say that. But at the same time, if we say, can we be working with China uh, to develop uh, uh, processes where we improve uh, uh, carbon efficiency of, uh, of our economic growth, um, you can do that at the same time. And so uh, a, a moral foreign policy can include our ability or willingness to express our views uh, about values without uh, uh, thinking that you're going to make sure that uh, China becomes a democracy or, or a liberal democracy as, as you see in the West. Uh, but it doesn't matter whether they're a liberal democracy or not, when you come to a question like dealing with climate change, you're going to have to work together uh, with a lot of countries that are authoritarian countries, because that's the nature of the problem. Thank you. Now, I have a question here from Andrew Leung. Uh, when morality conflicts with what a leader perceives as a national imperative, uh, how could morality prevail? Well, uh, again, it depends on how you define the national imperative. There are times when uh, you may have no choice or very little choice. The classic example of this, which I mentioned in the book, was the situation that Churchill faced in 1940 after the Hitler broke through the Ardennes and drove the British into the sea at Dunkirk. And uh, there was a worry that uh, the defeated French government might hand over the French fleet to, uh, to Hitler. And uh, in that case, Churchill felt he could not defend the British islands uh, if he did, didn't have uh, naval superiority. So he actually bombed the French fleet, his own allies, and he killed 1,300 French sailors. Now you could say this is the most horrible immoral thing you can imagine, except that Churchill's view was that he had almost no choice since it was a matter of survival. The people who had elected him in England depended on him for protecting their survival. And in circumstances like that, you have what's sometimes called lifeboat ethics. Um, there's no room for morality. Um, but you can't go from that to the view that most of international politics is a matter of survival. It's usually not. So when going back to Trump, when Trump was faced with the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in the uh, Saudi consulate in Istanbul, uh, he said, well, we have interests with Saudi Arabia, arms sales, oil, and so forth. So we're not going to say anything about this. And even the conservative Wall Street Journal uh, uh, editorial page said, this is not enough. You have to express American values that this was a horrific action that was taken. Uh, it doesn't mean you break, alliance, break your uh, relations with uh, uh, Saudi Arabia or send in the 82nd Airborne to, uh, to uh, take over Riyadh. It does mean you can uh, withdraw the ambassador or make a statement or uh, have something where you uh, cease arms sales that are being used in, in Yemen, so forth. So by treating everything as though it's uh, all foreign policies, as though it's Churchill facing Hitler as a matter of survival in 1940, uh, you're trivializing the area for moral decisions in foreign policy. Most cases are, are hard cases in which you have to make trade-offs uh, in terms of uh, how much you advance your values and, and your other interests. Uh, so I think that, again, it's, it, it's not either or. The, the hard choices in life are in this uh, middle area. Now, I have a question here uh, from Mark Michelson. Uh, regarding President Obama's foreign policy, you mentioned Libya as a low point, but would you evaluate the effectiveness and legacy of his administration's policies 
for example, toward Afghanistan, the Arab Spring, and Russia's annexation of Crimea? Well, I think these are areas where Obama was not able to do uh, very much. He, in Afghanistan, he tried uh, to have a troop surge to reverse the uh, uh, bad situation on the battlefield. Uh, that uh, was not particularly successful. Uh, if you take uh, the issue of uh, uh, Crimea um, and uh, Russian intervention in the eastern Ukraine, um, uh, Obama did uh, uh, help put on sanctions or support sanctions against Russia for that, which I think was important to show that violating a basic norm of the UN, which is you don't steal your neighbor's territory by force, um, is, is something which will be costly if you do it. Uh, so I think he gets some credit for that. The ability to reverse uh, the Russian behavior uh, is, is uh, I think, was beyond his capacity. So I would argue that, um, and on the Arab Spring, um, uh, the ability to uh, manage the Arab Spring, uh, I think, was beyond the capacity of the U.S. or any uh, country outside of, uh, of the Arab countries themselves. Uh, so I think he was faced with a set of issues where uh, he did the best he could given the circumstances, but I would not say there were particularly successful outcomes. Thank you. Now, uh, I have a question from Michael Young, uh, Haran. Um, Professor, which country in Asia would you rate as top tier in soft power? And what would you advise uh, Xi Jinping on a good soft power strategy? Well, I, I think, uh, uh, if I were to pick a country that, uh, as they say, punches above its weight in soft power, it would be Singapore. Uh, you know, it's five million people, small, um, uh, and yet it's, it's been able to um, play a role in which it attracts others in the region. Uh, it's had various educational programs for bringing people from other Southeast Asian countries to National University of Singapore. It's had uh, various, uh, it's played a major role in, in the uh, development and support for ASEAN. Um, Singapore, I think, has, has um, uh, been surprisingly successful in its soft power initiatives, um, despite its, uh, its small size. Uh, I, I think uh, that, uh, you know, for China to increase its soft power, uh, it should relax uh, more and allow more of its civil society to, uh, to go out and prevail. In other words, it has Confucius Institutes, which are designed to teach Chinese uh, culture, and which, uh, which is an attractive culture. But um, uh, it sometimes undercuts that by its insistence on tight party control. So if a Confucius Institute at an American university uh, wants to uh, invite somebody to talk about Taiwan or, uh, or uh, Xinjiang, uh, they'll find uh, uh, restrictions in some cases. That's a mistake. It's better to allow the free speech and to get the reputation for being open to different views and to allow your civil society to, uh, to uh, ex express itself in breadth rather than insisting on tight uh, uh, party control on all, all aspects of civil society. Thank you. Now, I have a question uh, about education. Education is a great way to encourage mutual understanding. What impact do you see of Trump's policy of restricting Chinese students, what that might have on the US-China relationship? Oh, I think restricting Chinese students is a, it's a, is a, a very stupid uh, policy. Uh, we benefit enormously from having Chinese students in the United States. Um, uh, some of them uh, stay in the US and become important uh, contributors, either as citizens or green card holders. Others return to China, but they return with a much broader understanding of what the United States is like with both its virtues and its flaws. 
So I think uh, having 375,000 Chinese students in the United States, which is what we had in the year before the pandemic, is good for us and good for China and good for relations between the countries. So I have been very critical of this idea of restricting Chinese students. Now you could say, what about students who come from the PLA and are put into programs at MIT or Caltech to try to uh, steal intellectual property? That's a different proposition that should be dealt with as intellectual property theft uh, as a crime. But that's not what Chinese, that the majority of Chinese students are doing in the United States. Thank you. Now, uh, Professor Nai, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about the pandemic. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of the impact of the pandemic going forward, not just on uh, US-China relations, but, but just in sort of the, 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 uh, the geopolitical balance of power, if you will? Uh, well, it's, uh, I, I wrote a little article for Project Syndicate uh, saying that one could imagine five different scenarios uh, for what the world would look like 10 years from now as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and uh, when one tries to predict the future, there's no one future. A lot will depend on what we do, how things develop. But uh, uh, so I, I think you can imagine situations in which the world is worse, in which the world is better. Uh, and I, I tried to spell out some of these differences. But on the, on the one that you mentioned, uh, is the pandemic going to cause China to replace the United States as the world's uh, largest power? Uh, I don't think so. I think uh, uh, it's interesting to go back to 1918, where you had the great influenza pandemic, um, which killed more people than died in World War I. And if you ask to what extent did that lead to a geopolitical uh, world that was totally different in 1930 than in 1918, uh, the answer is most historians say that the, uh, the changes geopolitically, such as the rise of communism or the rise of fascism in the 30s, was caused more by uh, the World War effects of World War One than of the pandemic. So I don't think the effects of the pandemic are going to lead to a sudden geopolitical reversal if we look ahead to 2030. I think most likely is that the uh, you'll see a continuation of existing trends, uh, the continuing rise in the power of China. The pandemic may speed up China's economic uh, uh, advantages slightly uh, by a year or two, but uh, in terms of American military power, or American soft power, uh, I don't think that uh, the pandemic is going to reverse those, particularly if you have a uh, change in, in presidency in, in uh, this November. Uh, if Trump is reelected and continues the inept policies he's had for managing the pandemic, then it may turn out that the pandemic has more effect than I've expected. One last question before I turn it back to Alice Mong. You write at the conclusion of your book that the next president, quote, will face the moral challenge of defining a foreign policy where America provides global public goods in cooperation with others and uses not only hard power, but also our soft power to attract their cooperation. And you then say the future success of American foreign policy may be threatened more by the rise of nativist politics that narrow our moral vision at home than by rise and decline of other powers abroad. So I'm wondering, uh, just to close, if you could just uh, uh, explain a bit the, your thoughts on uh, Yes, on I, that. I, I sometimes put this uh, it, it facetiously, and I'm more worried about the rise of Trump than the rise of China. Uh, I think that uh, uh, this populism we've seen in the last few years uh, is not very healthy. But there's encouraging evidence from a recent poll by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs that shows that a public support in the United States for an outward looking uh, multilateralist type of foreign policy is higher than it was in 2016, indeed higher than it's been for years. So I'm, I'm hoping that we're gonna see a, a situation which will change after the uh, 2020 uh, election.
I'm breaking trust. I'm I'm lying. I have one more question. Uh, in in a flat, uh, globalized world, soft power seem to be highly effective. However, with borders coming up, nationalism on the rise, and the world broadly becoming less globalized, what is the future of soft power? Does this mark a shift back to greater importance of hard power? And this is from Adriel Chan. Well, I think you're. I think hard power and soft power going to always coexist. Um, and there's some circumstances where soft power is less effective, uh, hard power more so. I don't think you solve the problems of Kim Jong-il and North Korea with soft power. Uh, that's largely a hard power situation. I don't think the world as a whole is changing in such a way that uh, soft power becomes irrelevant. I think you're going to find that you need a mixture of hard and soft power. And that's what I call soft and smart power. Thank you very much, Professor Nine. It's been a, truly a pleasure and honor for me. And I'm going to ha hand it back to Alice Mong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Professor Nye. Thank you for those thoughtful words. Uh, it's, I'm really glad we had this uh, evening to spend with you uh, and to hear from your wisdom. And we hope it's not going to be another um, a decade or so f before we have you back. And now with the magic of technology, uh, we hope to have you back anytime. Uh, during this time of the pandemic, I think it's um, I think hearing programs like this um, that kind of gives me hope and uh, that they're and also books. I can't really recommend uh, enough uh, to for in fact, uh, information is already out on the website. Feel free to order the book. We are looking forward to having uh, Professor Nice book at our bookstore uh, in time for Christmas. And I know what I'm going to be giving uh, out for Christmas to a lot of my friends who are very much interested in soft power, uh, like myself, but also moral leadership. And I want to again thank Professor Nice for uh, for tonight's program and thank all of you for joining us tonight. Um, it's uh, it's a really exciting times these days uh, here in Hong Kong and globally. And we have other programs coming up. Uh, in fact, I think Professor and I talked about George Bush. We're going to have uh, Jeff Bush with us, uh, uh, along with Jack Oliver. Uh, again, a members-only conversation. And this is uh, on October 29th, a few days before the election. We will hear directly from the former uh, governor of Florida about it kind of maybe his predictions and maybe he'll give us some insights on a state that really um, was famous for its hanging chads. So please join us October 29th and also November 3rd. We are very delighted uh, Asia Society um, founders of our Japan Center, James Kondo and Jasper Cole is gonna to talk to us about the post Abe era in the Japanese politics. So these are two exciting programs coming up. And again, thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful evening. And we look forward to seeing you online and hopefully in person very soon. Good night. Yeah, thank you, Alice, and all my best to Hong Kong. Thank you, Professor Nye. All the best to you. <laughs>